Hi everyone, um, I'm Flavia Barbat, the Editor-in-Chief of Branding Magazine, and we're here with Donald Chestnut, who is the Global Chief Creative Officer of Sapient Nitro. Hey everybody. <laughs> so Donald, you recently started this role, mm -hmm. and before you were you were Chief Experience Officer. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious to hear how how, how that's different. How, how is your role uh, different now? What are, what are some of the things that, that you're working on that maybe you weren't working on before? What are some of the opportunities that you've been able to kind of grasp? Uh, I, love, I love that question because uh, I feel what I've done is taken a lot of the frame of my thinking in my chief experience role is brands are being built through experiences into the newer role of chief creative. But what, what I am doing is looking across a wider range of capabilities from communications through to transactions. But I, I do feel the ethos of being experience centric and I'll use quotes there kind of but experience centric and very consumer focused is exactly what Sapien Nitro is about so it's kind of a um, an evolution as I see it on a continuum of not only how I think but also how I feel the world is thinking that brands are continually being built through more experiential two-way interactive types of communications even in the case of communications yeah. and other, other types of transactions and what are maybe some of the biggest um, biggest changes that you'd like to make in the industry now that you kind of have taken the stance and you like I said you have this new role and there are so many changes happening at Sapient Nitro in the first place and and around can so I'm wondering what are some of the some of the changes that you'd like to take a hold of that you'd like to maybe affect yourself you know I'll, I'll start with something that might be a little controversial but that is kind of the notion of what is advertising someone okay. just asked me this recently and I think you know that that word is is so helpful and so unhelpful and we have an industry that is built and people understand what is today is advertising, but just as, as CAN has continued to evolve, building a brand and building a strong relationship between a brand and a consumer is not about just a push message. Yeah. It is about so much more. And I'm not, not by any means undermining the importance of film and even you know uh, broadcast oriented film because we have some f fantastic work that I'm very proud of, but uh, looking at the full ecosystem is about so much more. So that is one thing that I will continue to kind of fly the flag is how do we think in a forward, forward thinking way around what we do and what we do is build brands, build and strengthen brands. I also think we build and strengthen brands in, in respect of the, the consumer's shoes. So from cons consumer's viewpoint outwards. And you and you and that's based a lot on technology. So, what are maybe some of the some of the technologies that you're seeing affect the way that you can place yourself in co in consumers' shoes, so that you can then make those decisions and recommend those strategies, etc. That's a, that's a that's a great question. So, there's newer technologies, whereas my mind immediately goes to things like VR. Mm -hmm. So, kind of how do we take kind of uh, an environment and tell a story in kind of one long cut that is fully based in an environment. And I'm starting to see some really nice work this year in different categories and just different demos that is using VR to do what I think it can really do and do effectively. So that's one new technology. The other thing I'll just also say is in some cases it's not anything entirely new um, in the sense of that you can still tell stories through film but do it through a different channel. Yeah. And what I'm starting to also see is some long form film, a piece that we did for British Airways that's, you know, six minutes long. Yeah. You would never be able to do that in the old world of, you know, broadcast TV. But to be able to tell a story in a longer piece of kind of branded entertainment is just is fantastic. And that's, you know, due to technology and the new platforms that we have. And people, you know, the results are pre people do engage. Not everyone, not all the time, but, you know, <laughs> so I'm not saying that that's going to replace the, the 15 second little spot. But nonetheless, to tell a story in a longer form is fantastic. Fantastic. You know, that's really interesting that you say not everyone, not all the time, mm -hmm. because I think that maybe, well, I, I'd rather ask you this question, mm -hmm. but how are, how are clients reacting? Do you see that maybe they focus more on the quality of the audience and that targeted factor more than the quantity? Maybe it's not so much about how many views you can get, but what, what was the strategy and the method behind it that got you that number? Mm -hmm. And is it a more, you know, direct, selective audience? Oh, it's, it's, you're accurate? spot on. So I think many clients are looking at how do you actually make uh, an impression and an impression isn't just an eyeball mm -hmm. it is actually an impression emotionally intellectually and things and you do that in qualitative ways and you do that sometimes in quantitative ways and one is not necessarily important than the other but our world has changed so that now that that's the an opportunity we can do do both I'll, I'll also say that you know not every client is game for that some have an orientation towards okay it's it's higher numbers it's visibility it's they've got kpis that they're yeah. looking at and a lot of that is based on the way the industry ha has evolved 
but there is an opportunity and some clients need a little bit of coaching in the, in the, in the sales, in this, in the respective kind of, let's take a chance. Let's do something that might be four or five minutes long and we'll see in the, we, you know, we feel confident, but let's give it a whirl. So when, when you're, when you're working with these, these different audiences and things like that, there's obviously a lot of, a lot of personalization and a lot of, a lot of complexity, a lot of diversity that you have to deal with on the outside, mm -hmm. and and I think one of the things that I'm hearing a lot is that you know you need to you need to um, to practice what you preach mm -hmm. in the sense that if you want to speak to to diversity, if you want to speak to the diversity of the globe and of the consumer market, then you may also need to you know take that approach yourself internally. And mm -hmm. I know that's something that you're working mm -hmm. on quite a bit here at Ken. So maybe you can you can tell me a little bit about about why 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 did you choose. Why did you choose to take this stance here now? What is it about the industry or about maybe some of the work that you were talking about that, um, that you know, led you to this point? I think, uh, okay, I'll start with as consumers. I think our, you know, our spidey sense, our barometer is now up for what we think is fake, what we think is inauthentic, and uh, what we think is a shill. Yeah. So kind of if you're targeting me as a person, and I'll, I'll go, it goes back to my orientation as an experienced designer, is really trying to understand these aren't just marketing segments and targets and numbers of people, these are people. Yeah. And the more we begin to peel back the layers and understand, okay, it's not just a soccer mom, it's a woman that is working that is also um, balancing two young, really young kids and really trying to understand what are the drivers, the emotional drivers and the, just the, the standard kind of needs, the more we can, uh, I think, unpack and, and create better game changing work. So as consumers, kind of, you know, we're all very sensitive to what we feel is fake. And I think social media has really helped that way. As kind of designers think really understanding kind of what motivates and inspires is all the more important, which kind of leads me to the, my point that I made it in our main stage around kind of, you know, diversity is directly related to great work and will continue to be directly related to great work. If we don't have teams that really reflect in some form the people that we're looking at targeting, you know, it's a gamble. And kind of, and that's where I think we end up gambling for me messaging content creative that actually comes across as inauthentic. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you can kind of get towards a target, but if you don't hit right kind of, you know, the way people are actually thinking and feeling, it ends up, I think, oftentimes feeling inauthentic. But lastly, I'll add to it, the younger designers and the younger creatives I'm working with, they are more attuned to kind of the way the world is evolving kind yeah. of so as we look at there's a younger demographic a younger set of designers kind of how do we mix and make sure our teams reflect whether it's women whether it's lgbt whether it's people of color whether it's even the hip-hop so to speak yeah. kind of cultural aspects you need to reflect in, in in a and i think great work again is directly related towards diversity and in that i, I feel our industry just overall has a, has a big problem I, I i completely agree and i and i see the way so I think the way that diversity and creativity mix are, you know, and, and storytelling, sorry, mm -hmm. mix, I think is, is quite clear. I think people can understand that, you know, when you tell a story, there's, you know, there are certain nuances and certain, certain aspects of diversity that you can emulate with that. Mm -hmm. But what about technology? On the technology side, how is technology driving diversity and this kind of conversation? Because I kind of like to see the other side as well, rather than just, um, you know, a lot of people will talk about the stories, but what about the tech that, that can help you do that? So I'll take that question, it's a great question, I'll take it in, in one way, which is, it's not always new technology, but the, my favorite piece of work that came out in the past year, well I have many favorites, but one of the pieces as it relates to diversity is the piece that went viral for Tide, for mm -hmm. Tide Stain Stick. And it had, if, I don't know if you, you saw it, but it was made not actually by P&G, yeah. It was made on spec by a creative team who had a great idea that focused around a theme that is very contentious in many people's mind around gay marriage. And there's a middle-aged woman standing outside a church and there's two men about to enter the church, obviously about to walk into their wedding. And she stops them and says, no, you're not going in there. And you immediately think, the audience thinks, what's this going to be about? Is it opposition to gay marriage? And then she pulls out her tied stain stick and she's like, you're not going in that church to get married with that stain. And she, you know, she puts it on the shirt and then she goes, go boys, go, go do your thing, congratulations. It's a brilliant little spot and I saw recently the CMO of Procter & Gamble speak and he talked about kind of that spot was not done by P&G. It was done by a creative team who had a fantastic idea for how to tell a story and how to tell a story that in many people's mind would be kind of contentious. And in his speech he said if that had come through the teams at P&G and their agency partners it probably wouldn't have gotten made. 
So it's a perfect example of diversity marketing telling a story that works, that went viral, that actually was very successful, that talk, talks about kind of the product in a really effective way that probably and wouldn't have gotten done just given the processes, teams, maybe it's the biases that we have and oh, we don't want to take on that issue. What I also love is, is what Mark said kind of is once it went live and went viral, they jumped on. You know, they did what any brand would do because again, technology and social media has put brands in the hands of consumers. You know, his attitude to his team is like embrace it. Run with it on social media. We, you know, we can't stop this. So do this as if this were our creative, even though they didn't necessarily take credit for. It. And that's a perfect example of diversity-oriented marketing as it relates to issues, cultures, uh, minority groups, and how technology has kind of put, you know, the brands in the hands of consumers. That's great. What about what about internally? Um, I I think one of one of my biggest questions is, you know, instead of filling quotas, how can you how can you create a a type of diversity that that lives organically within your culture? Oh, that's that's a great question. Because I, I say it's a great question because people oftentimes go to quotas, and I do think hiring is in many cases one of the biggest areas that needs to be fixed. But I don't think you fix diversity through quotas. Quotas then immediately says you might not get the most perfect person from a capability perspective or an outlook perspective. You just get it from whatever your quota is. So I do think with hiring, it's priorities. And I will firmly say in many areas, as I look at our teams, I have priorities that I want people of a certain type from a diversity perspective, but I'm not always necessarily going to go. So priorities in hiring versus quotas is probably one of the number one areas. But I'll also follow up and say it, the problem needs to be attacked in many different other respects. It needs to be attacked from making sure that... Um, you know, from a cultural aspect, we don't have kind of attitudes and behaviors that we don't even realize, we call them unconscious biases. So making sure that everyone on the, on the team actually has a voice. So kind of thinking about the cultural aspects, the hiring aspects, just looking at kind of, you know, where your teams and, and some teams in, in our respect are doing really well. In other you know, cases, they need a little bit of help, but looking through and trying to figure out how do you unpack that problem. The other one thing I'll add is that we have another program that is our career return program that seeks to actually give people a jump start at senior level roles for, for some people that have taken time out oftentimes for yeah. a work, you know, a life challenge and kind of trying to value life experiences as much as on the job experiences because that's what also makes great marketing. So. And what have what have you seen what have you seen with that program? You know, how how are people <laughs> going through that experience. I, I'm, I'm really curious to hear how it how So it I'm going to speak from my perspective first and then I'll tell some others, but that seeing firsthand some of the people, and it's again going back to people, it's not just about the numbers, the, the, and it's only handfuls of people, this is not huge samples, mm -hmm. but this is also where I feel strongly. It comes down to people and people making a difference for other people. In some cases it's a micro action that begins to then change the world. Seeing the stories of some, so far it's been three women, now we have one man in the career return program you know there was one single single mother who took her family for you know two kids from Texas to New York to work through her returnship program so she uprooted her family you know, put her kids in new schools while she was training under our four-month program and you know for us there's a full expectation that after the returnship is done the career return and internship is done they will actually be hired full-time so it's really expected there's a runway there but the fact that in hearing her story and thinking oh she had fantastic job experience before took time out to raise her kids, now she's a single mom. The fact that she's taken her kids and moving to, in this case, it was our New York studio, that was just eye-opening for me. And then I thought, you know, if we can change the life of this person and her family and the team that she's working with, that's beginning to change the world. So it's not necessarily broad numbers of quotas, it's qualitatively going deep. And it changed for me the, my attitude towards commit. Do something, and even if you do something for three people and really help change those three people, if everyone did that, we wouldn't have a problem in 24 months or 36 months and things. So, wow. Okay. So that's that's really great. Are there any other any other, uh, for example, like like this program or like other internal programs? Are there any other steps that maybe organizations can take to to push diversity further, or maybe some kind of um, how should I say this mindsets that they can that they can adopt? Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple things. So our, our maybe not yeah. even internally, but also with clients yeah. as well. I think is a really big. I, deal. I think talking about it first of all that this is an issue that and, and you know that needs to be talked about even with clients and kind of how are we addressing the, the problem. 
two is thinking about external partners. I don't think any of us change all entirely on our own. We came to our main stage idea in, in discussions with our, our colleagues and friends at Pretty Bird who have a very different approach towards kind of diversity in management and leadership and all the other producers and directors that they work with. That's just what they do. They build yeah. you know authentic stories and tell authentic stories. And through the discussions there, so I think being very open around who you can work with, they also identified with, to us a number of organizations that are doing fantastic things taking folks that actually grew up in foster homes and then went to prison and retraining them actually as production assistants on sets and again you're changing the lives of a few people these people would never have jobs yeah. if, if it wasn't for this program so you know we've created a website that's makesomeroom.org that has a list of organizations that you can work with and to answer your question I think what other people can also do is think about the the, the power that you have the access that you have to resources and think about how can I use that for good? How can I use that in this case is, you know, you might want to partner with an external organization and start your own internship of, of whatever different form. The, the last thing I'll say is think about your culture. And for me also, we have a new program that we're rolling out that I'm excited about that's around unconscious bias. What are the biases that I might have that I don't even realize I have? What are the biases that we have within our office? And we have some really creative ways to unpack that. We took one of our best creative teams to actually go deep and figure out how do you actually train people to think differently. And there's an example that they have. They did an audit of our offices and then talked to some people. And even the, the first aid kits that we have in many of our offices around the world, we have band-aids in there or, you know, uh, little, uh, little whatever, the band-aids themselves. And in many offices globally, they're Caucasian. And what does that say to people of color? What does that say to pe the people of color all over the world that they don't fit or they're part of the minority? And they, little messages like this who photograph, so like what are the biases that we might have if you really value people? How is that coming across in all the different attitudes, behaviors, and even just ser services you have within an office? Awesome. So then my last question would be, how does this, how does this affect your work? How does this affect the, the end result? How do you see, and, and best case scenario, how would you like it to affect the work in the end? Uh, another great question. So I, I'll, I'll go back to diversity, I think equals great work. I think different perspectives provide different ways around a brief. And I also believe not just in diversity of people, but just capabilities. Kind of for us at SAP and ITO, technology is a big part of who we are, our future, our past. Oftentimes looking at an opportunity and then putting the right people on a team to think differently and really giving people open voices. Not always equal, because you need leaders, you need people to facilitate, and you need great creative leaders to kind of curate and direct and things. But at the same time, listen to people maybe from a different orientation. It could be from a user experience, it could be a developer standpoint. Some of our most award-winning work over the years actually germinated through the original idea came through a technologist. Kind of, and they might have the idea of how technology provides an interesting capability, but you might probably will need a creative to really reorient it into execution and the idea itself. So that's how I think, and that's where I'd like to see the, the world continue to go, is really have a, a much wider approach towards people, capabilities, cultural outlook, uh, racial, whatever it might be, kind of, and, and then kind of have the work begin to you know, really reflect where I think our world is going as it relates to technology. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you. So that was Donald Chestnut uh, from Sapient Nitro. Thanks for watching. And be sure to check out our con issue featuring other great thought leaders like Donald. Thanks, Flavia. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>